So it's a little after 5 a.m. and we're getting started. Time to get ready for WashiCon. Well, we're getting breakfast <laughs> on our way to WashiCon. I didn't tell anybody else I was filming this, but I guess I'm just giving a little update. How are spirits? Uh, dark. Right. Dark, dark spirits. <laughs> dark, dark spirits. Oh, cool. Mitch is here. Bye. We're officially at the convention. We figured out where we're supposed to go, but we just have to carry a bunch of stuff upstairs. Uh, Mitch, Matt, and Lena are all getting the vehicles, and well, we're gonna unload everything. Andy agrees. Till next time. Hello. What? So, Lena, how do you think everything's going to go? Fantastic. Really? Andy? Stupid. Stupid? Like your face. Like your face. Like you're falling off your chair. All right, Ken, how do you think we're going to do? All right. <laughs> Ken's so bad at predictions. Well, Mitch, how are we going to do? Like a pupper out. be fine. Cool. Cool. <sighs> Big Mitten Games. Formerly New Blue Games. Oh, yeah. Hey everyone! How's it going? It's going. It's, it's early. It yeah. is early. It is early. Um, my name is Lexan. I'm the lead programmer for this game. I am. <laughs> my name's Ken. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Ken. I'm the lead 3D artist. Lena, and I'm the concept artist. I'm Andy, and I'm uh, character design. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, we're here to talk to you about what's been our passion for some time now. Uh, a game we're calling Hex Comics. It's an indie game in really early alpha stages. Uh, but the game is basically a real-time strategy from the perspective of the people on the earth. You guys can come up, by the way. I don't think we're going to fill up now. Okay, no. <laughs> they're cool kids. Yeah, they're cool kids. like a high school. They sit in the back. Um, anyway. Uh, it's a real-time strategy game from the perspective of the people on the ground. At least the audio back on the top. Well, my voice echoes no matter what we're It's uh, a real-time strategy from the perspective of the people on the ground. Uh, basically, we wanted to be closer to the action. We wanted to be able to walk within the cities that we've built, fly the vehicles we've created, and actually like use the guns that you make in the game. Uh, the game is 12 players, either locally or online, and we wanted to build an environment finely tuned for a fun, competitive, team-driven game. Matches take place on a procedurally generated map, which we hope will add diversity uh, to gameplay as for the, each game you'll be exploring new maps, fighting for resource-rich land, discovering hidden caverns, and picking the most strategic locations for your games. 
The terrain will also change up combat as battles can take place on land, in the air, in the sea, or on a fourth area we're still working on. <laughs> um, ground combat will be probably the most familiar because um, you can use ground vehicles as well as guns um, and stuff like that. The air combat will be considerably more fast paced, considerably more dangerous. You'll be flying behind enemy lines, blowing buildings up, and uh, trying to avoid getting shot by the pilot. The uh, underwater combat is going to be <coughs> a little more strategic. You'll be hidden, so you can plan out an attack and uh, hide while you're still secluded. But there could always be someone else in the water. You're welcome to switch to the screenshots. Yeah, I'm going to switch to screenshots now. Come on in, we'd love to have you. Let's around. All right, that's fine, that's fine. So, um, one of the things we struggled with really early on with this game was the game's objective. The obvious choice was to have a last team standing approach where you pretty much just go in and attack until, you're, until every other team is gone. But, given the team-based nature of our game, we thought that wasn't a very good fit. We feared things would play out like a bad game of Monopoly, where one side gains momentum really early on and becomes unbeatable. That leaves every other player to struggle to survive and eventually be taken out uh, for the duration of the game. So we needed something that kept players engaged until the end and stopped matches from dragging out past the point where it stopped being played. We're still working on everything, but the system we've come up with is where you earn points for making buildings, and those points are taken away when the buildings are destroyed. On top of taking points for destroying buildings, you will also get the resources back that it took to make the building. <clears throat> that mechanic itself really drives gameplay as destroying is so much faster and easier than building, but destroying doesn't create points and only takes them away from the players. This encourages a back and forth combat as weaker teams have, who have fewer points to offer. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. <clears throat> it makes the gameplay a lot I think more even, because if one team is absolutely dominating, all, the big team has very little to gain from picking on the little team. The little teams have a lot to gain from picking on the big teams. Uh, basically, if you're losing, you're one well-placed nuke away from a combo. Uh, you can go into an enemy base and just annihilate them and get back the resources you lost, get back the uh, points you lost. Uh, I think that will encourage a, a big back and forth game. As your base grows, however, you get closer to being victorious, but you also have a bigger target on your back. Um, of course, you also get points for individual kills if you're in a uh, more traditional firefight. You get a point for every kill you get, you lose a point for every death that you get. Um, and on top of that, teams are awarded points for harvesting resources itself, which we think will help the rest of the match. And in a traditional RTS, you can harvest resources by building a unit and assigning them to collect resources for you. Because we couldn't do that, we had to think of something different. We started out having players manually buying resources in caves, but it felt boring and we and took players out of the gameplay. While you can still chop down trees and there are special resources you can mine, the majority of the resources we gather are from others as you see that. Uh, you can walk to one of the 12 randomly played populists and play them. They'll each provide you with a steady stream of one of a variety of different resources. Other players can come in and claim your obelisk, so it adds a territory element to the game. Resources themselves give you points, and they allow you to make buildings, vehicles, weapons, so if you control them, you'll likely win the game. Do you want to talk about what you do? <laughs> Um, I mostly just help out, um, uh, whatever they need, I try to work on it. Um, we're trying to work on getting the concept art nice. I mean, we have the gameplay down, um, we want to make like posters and more, uh, a little bit more artsy look on it. Um, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do a lot of talk about how to make the game better. Cool. Uh, that's, uh, and it's a lot more fun to get vehicles. 
Um, it, it's a really big terrain. So you get a lot, a lot of possibilities, but the vehicles help actually utilize that. How are you, Andy? Uh, well, as you can see, I, I do stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, character art, basically pull it all right out of where the sun doesn't shine, um, and hope something sticks. Yeah, I didn't do that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for a game like this, uh, the character design is really uh, random. Who here has played Time Splitters? Hey, you uh, got one. Anyway. I know that one is too, he's not paying attention. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, right? Why do you want two, brother? As you know, those they have really random characters, and that's kind of our goal with this. We'll have big characters, small characters, time splitters has that fish bowl that runs around. You know, just random crap. I, I, like, I like the monkey. Yeah, yeah. that was good too. But it's it's really nice uh, to not be constrained by having to fit a certain genre. Uh, so yeah. Just, just gotta be creative and come up with something. Yeah. Do you have any questions for us? We can go through more. Sure. I know. I know. Something that just came in. But, um, anyway, what? Um. So we didn't really talk about this too much, but one of the inspirations we had for this game was basically I was playing a game of Minecraft. I was playing the game of Minecraft, and I was thinking about how wonderful it would be if there was some competitive mode you could play with it. And so that thought continued to evolve, continued to evolve, until eventually got to the point where we're at, where you're in a procedurally generated environment where <coughs> matches should be different every time. And I thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice if you had vehicles, if you had weapons, if you had objectives. And that's kind of where things eventually went. We started working on more and more complicated stuff. We started doing more and more gameplay. And basically just work on refining it. That's what we did. Any questions? I feel like this is a panel. I'm not interacting with people. Mm -hmm. How long have you guys been working on this? Oh, an absurdly long amount of time. Because we... A big turn. A personnel turn. Uh, oh, that's also true. Yeah. Um, we went from nothing to trying to make a game. So when you do that, there's so many skill sets that you haven't learned. There's so much that you have to do. So as Ken was pointing out, we get a lot of people that will show up for a week, maybe two weeks, and then there you go. Uh, <laughs> a week, maybe two weeks, and then drop out. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. But I find that you sh I try not to resent them for leaving. Just be glad they were there for two weeks, whatever they can do. But yes, the, the answer to your question is we've been doing this for three whole years. Uh, we're in very early alpha stages, as I said. So core gameplay isn't fully functional yet. A lot of the things that we hope to add, obviously, aren't in there yet. We have an arcade cabinet actually set up, so you guys can play the alpha right now if you'd like. In Artist Alley. In Artist Alley, yes. And hopefully not right now. Yeah, don't get up right now. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, one important thing to consider is what he said to uh, expand upon it is really none of us had any idea what we were doing going into it. So it's all a learning process. And some people learn faster and better than others. Yeah. Some people are more willing to learn than others. <laughs> I'm sure you see a lot of that. But yeah. No, but it, it's been a really fun experience. Um, it's like there's a certain point in my life when I figured if you could do anything, what would you want to do? I'd be at the top of the list. I think it's cool you find two books. I know when, uh, when we first started working on it, we had a lot of different ideas what we wanted from the game. And actually, now you can this to the Yeah, the, the you know, one from a zombie grammar that's right here. Yeah. We wanted a game that we would want to play, so we had to all vote on everything. Yeah, at first it was primarily uh, first. Or a single player zombie outbreak game, and it shifted to this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot in between, too. We're a big mid game, I don't know if I ever said that. That's, that's our. That's our um, yeah, cool. Any more questions? You in the front. Any questions? <laughs> Can you tell me about this? <laughs> oh, that's a machine shop, stranger. 
here. So, a lot of this might be self explanatory, but the basic uh, gameplay would be you make a building like this one, and within it you can research a variety of different vehicles. We only have three that are playable right now. We have a buggy, which is just a, a traditional car. We have a quadcopter cycle, and we have a biplane. Uh, we plan on expanding those quite a bit, but those are the only ones that we have right now. But uh, early on, we realized that it's hard to make an incomplete game engaging. And one of the best ways to do that was vehicles. That was one of the first things where people started playing around with vehicles. That was like the only fun thing you could do. So it became a core game mechanic really early on, where that's how you traverse a larger map. That's how you could attack people. <laughs> that's how you can do a wide variety of things. And that's also when we started adding in different terrain types, where we thought, well, we basically, I mean, I think a lot of games that have different terrain types often say, hey, we're going to make a bunch of stuff in the ground, we're going to make maybe one or two things in the air, and then like one thing in the water. And we really want to try and give each one equal weight. Uh, water programming is outlandishly difficult, so we don't have anything in the water right now. But we plan on having an equal mix of land and sea. What software do you use? It looks like you use Blender and something else. Yes. Yeah, I'm the 3D model, uh, the 3D modeler, so I do a lot of that stuff uh, in Blender. What platform do you run your game in? Uh, Unity, yeah. Unity is just, the, un the Unreal Engine is getting more and more popular. Um, and when that became available, there was a big question of, do you switch to Unreal? And my thought was, maybe with the next game, <laughs> but just, just switch engines halfway through. I'm going to do this thing. Um, cool. What kind of games do people play in this group? I was going to ask, I know you just said that you guys have been trying to learn all these things in two yeah. three years. How do you balance this huge project on top of probably trying to keep up with jobs? That's true. Um, yeah. I'm so, sure you guys haven't like quit your right. you go full time yet. I know. Hard to believe not successful yet. Um, <laughs> that actually is extremely difficult. You run into a situation where your loved ones are being ignored. You, uh, you, know, you have that full time job. It's. I used to work third shift, and the disadvantage to that was I didn't see my family and friends. The advantage to that was I was home at night all by myself. <laughs> so it's like I would I would go to work, work a 12-hour day there, then on my days off I would just work the same shift on the game. I got a ton of stuff done, but yeah, I think my, my life did definitely suffer because of that. I guess what I would suggest, they say that a rule of thumb is you should never go a week without working on your passion. If you go more than a week, the odds of you dropping it go dramatically. And I think that that's been one of the things that's been the most difficult for us. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful thing to consider when you ask someone else to join up with you. When someone else has their own life, how much of their life are they going to give for a project that they weren't with when it started? Uh, and so I think that's where it's really important to be understanding about other people's uh, lives. Uh, and we're constantly looking for new people. Oh yeah, if anybody in here is. <laughs> uh, yeah, we actually can. We're surprisingly good at recruiting people. <laughs> yeah, I brought in like maybe what four or five people. Yeah, uh, we have we have a guy uh, Bjark who's from Denmark. We have Declan from the UK. Uh, so the, basically, the way that works is they would just um, Skype. They could work on something. Skype. But that, that's worked out really well, and actually, it's been really great meeting these people. All over the world. Yeah. yeah. So it's nice because you don't necessarily need to be near each other to work on something together. Yeah. Because we're all from West Michigan. We're from the Grand Haven, Muskegon area. Uh, so, yeah, that'd be, that'd be quite a drive. <laughs> is it that easy to send the information back and forth from here? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the science is decent science. No, it's not too large. Right now, the entire game project is only like 400 megabytes. Uh, 3D models, no, how big is a typical 3D model that we're working on? A couple megabytes. Yeah, a couple of megabytes. Yeah, it's not, it's not too bad. Now, right now I'm the only programmer. And if you were to have multiple programmers at the same time, things get complicated. Where I wrote this line, you wrote a different line in that same code, how do we reconcile those differences? Uh, but we haven't really had to worry about that too much. So, concept art, you know, you send a picture over Facebook. So, that's not too difficult. 
Hmm. Uh, we're working, we don't have much need for it yet, but we're working with other voice actors, and yeah, I think that, that's just a basic audio file. Obviously, you'd want to uncompress, but even then, we're only going to be using small lines. So, no, it actually syncs up pretty well. We've been using Google Drive, uh, which has caused us enormous problems. <laughs> but uh, I, I still think it is probably the best platform. We yeah, have sometimes uh, my files, which I don't get online often, which somehow makes it so that it erases his changes. Yeah, and that's when we realized that I used to have the entire project on there, and I had this idea that you could go on and just start up the project from any computer or anywhere on the planet and just modify things. And it doesn't work out that way uh, because we had a situation where, for example, if someone if someone has an older version of the game and they modify something, it erases everyone else's newer version of the game. So now what I do is I have the whole project on a folder, and every two weeks or so, I upload that to the main site. That, that, that's what we can do. And that's worked out pretty well. Like I said, because some people can send 3D models, I can send a build of the game. Uh, and with it being Unity, it's so much quicker. Uh, a, a build for the game probably takes about two minutes. So uh, uploading probably takes more time than building. So you're able to have a relatively quick turnover. We, and we haven't we have, we have talked about this at all, uh, We plan on releasing the game for real, realistically every platform we can get it on. Uh, we're in talks with uh, Nintendo. Uh, <coughs> we want to work with Ouya, which is like the most unknown. You're probably the only person in the room that knows the Ouya. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of the Ouya? We almost bought it. Wow! Oh, oh, yeah. it. I'm oh, sorry, say that again? We almost bought it. That's what we did. Then we realized that yeah, horrible thing. <laughs> it's, it's not as bad as you might think. It's the way I put it is it's the only entry level console. Um, after that, the next jump is the Wii U. You know, so there's just there's this chasm. Technically Razor. Well, okay, yeah, Razor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing I like about it is you're able to have a console experience for cheap and yeah, you can just develop for it. And you don't even need their permission if you don't want it. Um, we also, uh, we would like to be on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, on Steam through Windows, Mac, and Linux, uh, and then way down the line we might port it to mobile, but that's, that's, we have to optimize our game quite a bit to get it. The idea is, the longer we wait to put it on mobile, the more we can optimize and the faster phones will be, so <laughs> there's going to be some Apex with things just to perfect that. No Oculus. So what? I said no Oculus. So, that's, that, he really wants to. I am outlandishly excited about the Oculus. I've been saving up for a computer that can run the Oculus, and then after that I have to save for that. So with the Oculus Rift, working on it, I feel like it would be best done with a VR game first, and if you're going to port it to another system later, that's good. Our game had no vision for being a VR game. If we think, and honestly, sometimes I think about, so, they had that, and this is Microsoft, but they had that Minecraft demonstration where you like play Minecraft on a table. And I think our game might work out pretty well with that. If you had this, which I guess is back to RTS and we're like distant, is what we're, the whole point of the game, but I think that would be fun. If you could see your characters running around and it would, we could just visualize, I, could, I think that'd be fun. I guess what I would say is if we could come up with a way where we aren't Sacrificing VR, I would absolutely like to. That's like once you're in Oculus, now you gotta get in Vive, now you gotta be in PlayStation VR, now you gotta go to Steam VR. Yeah. yeah. Steam VR. Who's got 600 bucks to drop on an Oculus? Yeah. <laughs> Who here is trying to get an Oculus? <laughs> Even you're not getting an Oculus. That's why. I'm on the edge of either Vive or Steam VR. Yeah. Because they're a bit more powerful and they are better and possible. Well, I might get that hardboard cutout that works with my wife's phone. I, I, might, I might do that. The, 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 yeah, the fifteen dollar one. I, I can get. I can get behind that. I, well, that's the thing, because it's like I'm already planning on getting an Oculus. I'm already planning on saving up that money. So it's like, do I want to do the fifteen dollar experience if I know I'm going to do the full one? I'm boring. A huge amount of this audience I really buy. Um, any, no, any questions for us? I mean, these two are really active. Oh. oh. So we have a day-night cycle, which actually makes the game look a lot better. But when you have a dark it. image on a white uh, surface, it looks really dark. Probably for time. Although the people behind you can probably see it on my screen. So. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, it's true. It's true. It's true. Have you talked about the season of your I mentioned it briefly. Go over it again. So that's a procedurally generated map. Um, we messed around with the size quite a bit. We might, we might end up tweaking that a little bit more. But it's like floating islands with different levels of elements. Yeah, we originally had it. We, we, the game's called Hex Complex because it's a hexagon-based grid system. We wanted to go with a hexagon-based grid system instead of a traditional grid system because we thought, one, it looked a lot like Minecraft. But two, uh, with, with a hexagon grid, you don't have any continual straight lines. Uh, the lines always uh, lead. So you're allowed to get a more natural look, I guess. And from there, we actually had a wide variety of different tile types. But we eventually focused on just three. Water, field, and mountains. And so as you can see, the mountains build up from we also have a desert tile, which is rare. Which is rare. But the only reason why we ended up having a desert tile was I turned off water once and we all thought it looked pretty cool. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, why we, that's why we have a desert tile now. Um, you don't want to turn it white and it's not hot? Who knows? No, because see. No, snowmobiles. Yeah, we'll have snowmobiles in the game. Uh, so. Special well, December edition. Yeah, December <laughs> edition. Uh, there's always this feature creep has been such a big problem in our studio. Uh, we always ask the question, would this make the game better? Yes, it would make this game better. Well, then shouldn't you do it? It's like, and the, the How answer, long would it take for us to release the game? Yeah. yeah, and the answer is yes. The answer is yes, we should put it in. And so the release structure that we're looking at right now is we would like to release the game in beta format on emerging apps like Ouya or maybe some other ones. Maybe Steam Greenlight, but I'm kind of cautious about that because it's so flooded lately. But uh, at, at half price, basically do the Minecraft release structure. Because I think it worked out great for them. The, I mean, my goodness, they were able to take this small concept, expand the application over the course of a long time, and make what is arguably one of the best games ever made. Uh, and so we look at that release structure and we think that, that sounds pretty good. And then eventually we'll release uh, a complete package um, on pretty much anyone who will have us, and then eventually roll out everything else that we plan on doing with free updates. Uh, I think the DLC's uh, got such a bad name on it right now, but our goal isn't to nick or nine people, our goal is to release the game that we want to release from the beginning. But that being said, everything changes. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Any more questions? Comments, concerns? Oh, comments. Theories. <laughs> Theories. <laughs> um, how many people here have ever wanted to make a game? I got, I got two. two. Oh, I got, I got a third one. Cool. <laughs> and you're always smiling, too. So happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, um, I wanted to show it taking damage so you're not here. Yeah, I was wondering, like, because you spent so much time trying to do the screenshot. Yeah. And then, uh, Oh yeah, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. Cool. Yeah, these these screenshots might look a little bare bones, but that is obviously because it is so pre-alpha. Yeah. One thing I really wanted to emphasize is that everything is interactable. There isn't a, like a building that you can't enter. There's like, anything you can't destroy. Um, it's a really freestyle game. Yeah. Free ball. Not that. Anyway, <laughs> cool. I think we'll probably wrap up that. Um, if anybody wants to talk to us about anything after the fact, um, we're more than willing to hear you guys.